Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to today's community conversation at Western Michigan University Cooley Law School. My name is Paul Zelensky. I'll be your facilitator. April is Sexual Assault Awareness Month, and today we, we want to have a conversation about how to recognize domestic violence and sexual assault and take action. We are joined today by the Honorable Rosemarie Aquilina, who was elected to the 30th Circuit Court for Mick Ingham County in November of 2008. Previously, she served as the 55th District Court Judge for four years, during which time she served as Chief Judge as well as Sobriety Court Judge. Judge Aquilina also retired honorably from the Michigan Army National Guard after 20 years of service. She became a part of Michigan's history by becoming the first female JAG officer in the Michigan Army National Guard when she enlisted. She's a proud alum of Cooley Law School and received her bachelor's degree from Michigan State University. She's been a longtime activist in promoting domestic violence and sexual assault awareness and a strong victims advocate, which started way before she received national attention from the Larry Nasser case just a few years ago in 2018. Again, a proud graduate, an accomplished author, an adjunct professor here at the law school for which she received the Coveted Griffin Award for teaching excellence. Now, those of you who have joined us before know that this is a, a conversation and we want to encourage you to ask questions. We will be recording today's program. If you are not speaking, please mute, mute your audio. Also, if you do not want to be seen, please turn off your camera. But before we get started today, we, we must acknowledge today's topic. Sexual assault and domestic violence can be difficult to talk about. If you or someone you know is experiencing sexual violence or domestic violence, there are a number of local and national resources to help, one of which is RAIN, the Race, Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network. It's the largest anti-sexual violence organization. They have a 24-7 confidential hotline, which we'll put in the chat which is 800-656-HOPE. And Terry will also be placing um, other resources in the chat as well. So let's get the conversation started. Judge Aquilina will make a few opening remarks and then we'll be open to questions. Please feel, feel free to unmute and ask your question directly, or you can place them in the chat. Judge Aquilina, we're so glad that you're here. We know that you've been busy. Um, so why don't you get the conversation started with some opening comments? All right, well, thank you. There is no greater recognition than I could ever receive than to be asked to speak by my law school. When I was in school, I never thought I would get to this place. So it's such an honor to be here with all of you. Sexual assault, domestic violence needs to be eradicated. And it's something that I have fought against since my early days of practice. And one of the things that I have learned throughout my life and in my practice, and quite honestly in law school, is that Without a voice, there's no choice and there's no change. And I've never worried about consequence to me for speaking up. Instead, I've made a conscious decision to speak up and take action. And I want to thank you all for participating in this conversation because it's important. And by your participation, you are also making that conscious choice to become a part of this discussion and to eradicate sexual assault, domestic violence in all of its forms. We all have a responsibility to continue the conversation for, for change. And I'm always amazed at how many people want to turn a blind eye and say, it's not happening in my house, it's not happening to my neighbors, it's not happening in my community or my world. Recently, I had a young woman, the mother of three, she had been in a seven year relationship with a man. And she'd been abused for countless years in many ways by him. Finally, she found the strength and there were neighbors who finally reported and were able to testify. Her significant other was charged with two counts of criminal sexual conduct. First degree, those are life offenses. One count of home invasion, first degree, resisting and obstructing law enforcement and aggravated stalking. And so that you understand how devastating the abuse of a loved one is, her testimony probably was about, with cross-examination and everything, should have been maybe an hour, an hour and a half. It took two days 
over several hours for her to tell her story. She did it in five to 15 minute increments because she couldn't speak without curling into a ball. We would take breaks when she broke down on the stand. And I learned after the trial that during those breaks, each and every time she was curled up in a ball on our Ingham County, very dirty, I'd like to say it was cleaner, but bathroom floor. And that's how she could cope, just being in a ball, calming herself down. And then she would proceed to enter the courtroom and we would continue. And it took hours and hours. The jury, after hearing all of the testimony, found guilty on all five charges. During her testimony, she said, I feel most abused by the system. No one listened to me. No one took action. And those words penetrated me. They penetrated the jury. And when the jury, because I always talked to the jury after they had their decision read in court and they retired back into the jury room, I always asked them if we can spend some time with them talking. And the prosecutor, defense counsel, students that I have, everybody who is involved, the lead detective come in and we talk to the jury, an open discussion, in part to help them feel better. Because when we walked in, and this is true of many jurors who hear horrific things, they were crying. And one of the jurors said to me, I've never seen that level of abuse. I didn't know it even existed in my neighborhood, in my community. And then the other jurors echoed that. And then the jurors said, tell the victim, we hope she believes in the system now. Tell her we truly believed her. And then they asked, what can they do? Through tears. And I told them, what I'm going to tell you today, be the voice, dial 911, intervene if it's safe for you to do, and you can do it. Otherwise, 911 is always a good number. If you can intervene, you can create a distraction. You, you can let the abuser know you're there. You can talk loudly on your phone, even pretending to have a conversation. You can play loud music. You can honk a horn. It depends on the situation. You can be a friend, walk up to them like you know them and say, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? That takes a lot of guts. Make sure you're safe. But sometimes that kind of intervention can save a life. If you are able to talk to someone who's in an abusive situation, make sure they know they matter. They're worthy of being treated better. They're worthy of being treated each and every day, 100% of the time with kindness and respect and offer to take them to a safe place. I told them to become CASA volunteers, CASA's court appointed special advocates. When I was in court as a practitioner, and I had abuse cases, child abuse and neglect cases. CASA volunteers were trained. They go into the home every week and they were the eyes and ears of the court. And we learned so many things that we never would have learned, which really helped the judges. So there's many ways people can get involved. You have to trust your gut and your five instincts. If you hear something, if it doesn't feel right to you, if you see something, if you smell something, um, Abusers have been known to abuse animals, kill animals, do all sorts of things. And you have to be mindful that someone's dog may be missing, not because it ran away, but because it's being used as a threat to the adults or the children in the home. Before we can help, we need to recognize what we're seeing, hearing, and feeling. And I want you to know as part of this conversation that every 24 minutes, someone is the victim of domestic assault. That is, during this hour that we're together, 1,440 will be assaulted. That is 34,560 per day, 12,614,400. So it's almost 13 million per year. Every 73 seconds, an American is sexually assaulted. Every nine minutes, that victim is a child. Only five out of every 1,000 perpetrators end up in conviction. Only 
four of those go to prison. One out of every six American women and one out of every 33 American men are victims of rape or attempted rape. Half, let me repeat that, half of the LGBTQ community have been raped. One in nine girls and one in 53 boys under the age of 18 are victims of sexual assault. One in 10 high school students are abused every year. If you think about it, the categories I've given you, you know, every one of you knows at least one person, if not many people who've been abused. I could talk about statistics all day long. They're out there. You can Google them. But these are not statistics to me and they shouldn't be to you either. These are human beings who need help. They need you to be their voice. So let's understand a couple of concepts. And I talk around the world about domestic, domestic violence, sexual assault, predatory behavior, a lot of related uh, topics. And I'm asked all the time, what is grooming and what is gaslighting? People don't know. So if you know, spread the word. And if you don't know, I'm going to give you a very simple definition. Grooming is a slow, methodical integration into a vulnerable person's life to gain trust. Oftentimes the vulnerable adult or a child, because we know children are vulnerable. Gaslighting goes hand in hand with grooming. Gaslighting is a form of psychological abuse and manipulation that causes a person to cast doubt on what they know and question their sanity or other perceptions of reality. Grooming and gaslighting are behaviors that predators use to manipulate their prey, the vulnerable person they have targeted. Many predators target more than one, although the victim feels I'm the only one, that is rarely true. Predators prey on multiple people at a time. Everyone has the right to feel safe in a relationship. If you can't be yourself, if you can't freely share your thoughts, hopes, dreams, accomplishments, and beliefs, then that relationship is not safe and it's abusive. So whether that applies to you or someone you know, we need to take action. Once you know what it is and can recognize it, hopefully the misinformation can be countered by real information, by confronting the predator. Predators are master manipulators. They mask their ulterior motives and take advantage of vulnerable persons' naivete. Predators rarely, if ever, recognize that they are offenders. They're in denial and they shift blame. Predators target the vulnerable. Children, think about this. Children, especially now with, um, we're locked in with the coronavirus and all the things that are happening with the pandemic. Sometimes children want to go out in the yard, walk the neighborhood. They need to have parental oversight. When we're not in a pandemic, there are a lot of children who don't have parental oversight because children are working. They can't afford childcare. We need to watch, be the watchful eyes of those children because children with less parental oversight are subject to predators. The predators make the children feel loved, important, the top of their list. Adults in relationships with them, uh, they interfere with those. They groom the children to rely on them, not the adults in their relationship. And they teach them to not question what's happening to them. Predators try to fill the needs of vulnerable people, try to isolate the vulnerable people and predators by grooming and gaslighting, cross boundaries. And we all need to make sure we have boundaries for ourselves, for our children, for our loved ones, and that they're allowed to question when someone crosses into those boundaries. So what are we talking about when we're talking about domestic violence or assaultive behavior? We need to look for signs of physical abuse, hitting, punch, kicking, shoving, choking, slapping, weapons. Does someone have weapons? 
uh, controlling what someone eats or drinks, forcing them to do work against their will, to use drugs or alcohol, to stop someone from seeking medical attention. How can you recognize these things? Because most of these things happen behind closed doors. Look at the people around you. Look at the people you socialize with, your friends. Are they wearing hats when they might not otherwise? Are they wearing a warm sweater when it's 100 degrees in Michigan or Arizona or wherever you are? Something that they don't usually do. Are they wearing too much makeup? Oftentimes the extra clothing, the hat, the makeup is covering cuts, bruises, bloodied hair, pulled out hair. Be mindful of those things. Emotional abuse can often be as damaging or more damaging than physical abuse. Emotional abuse is where the predator attacks someone's self-worth. They insult them, call them names, criticize them all the time, 24 seven. They act jealous, possessive. They withhold affection. They barter their affection for something they want. They cheat, they lie. Emotional abuse can be seen, can be heard. Again, intervene, tell that person that they matter, that they are worth more. Psychological abuse is also part of emotional abuse, threatening to hurt you, threatening to, threatening to hurt your children, threatening a child that if you tell, I'll hurt your dog, I'll hurt your family, I'll kill someone, I'll kill you, I'll kill your parents. Controlling the time that is spent with other people, isolating a victim. That's all part of psychological abuse and control. Predators steal belongings, damage belongings. They blame the victim for the abuse that they must undergo because they're bad people. And then when that's questioned, they gaslight saying, no, no, you deserve this. You earned it. You know that. Sexual abuse and coercion, forcing someone to perform sexual acts that they, that they wouldn't otherwise or voluntarily perform, demanding sex when someone's not willing to engage in sex, harming the partner by choking them, striking them, forcing them to watch pornography, insulting you in sexual ways, Reproductive coercion or abuse, making sure that someone does not use birth control or sabotaging the birth control, having someone go through an unwanted pregnancy or an unwanted abortion, regardless of the person's wishes. And those are things that hopefully medical people can start to recognize and be more trained on. If someone goes to the doctor and the partner won't let them alone. That's a sign. Financial abuse is another sign. Preventing someone from having access to bank accounts, to necessities, monitoring how they spend their money, demanding receipts, refusing to contribute to expenses or to their expenses when they're part of the household and when they have earnings, having them demand to turn over their paycheck. Abuse through technology, something I see all the time on the bench, sending insulting or threatening messages over texts or email, social media, using social media, Facebook and other sites to track what someone's doing, demanding that sexually explicit photos or videos be sent or threatening that if they're not sent, something bad will happen. When someone wants to look through and doesn't just want, but demands to look through someone's phone or computer to see the context, to see the activity. That is all, those are all forms of abuse. If that's happening to a child, a loved one, if it's happening to you, it's abuse. Ordering you to keep your phone on you, ordering you that if you don't answer it, there will be punishment. Following a person, using technology to track. I once had a victim in front of me where these stalker actually put a phone on their the battery of their car so that they use that phone as a tracking device the victim found out because she was going along the highway with an open window because there was no air conditioning in her car and her 
car started ringing and she pulled over and said, what is this ringing? It's not my phone and found the phone of her stalker attached to the battery. He was convicted. Calling multiple times after you've told someone you don't want to hear from them. That's part of stalking. It makes you feel unsafe. All of those signs need to be watched and you, if you recognize them, speak up on behalf of that person. Human trafficking, huge problem, not just in our area, but around the world. How can you recognize human trafficking? There's multiple ways. Does a young person appear to be disconnected from family, friends, community organizations, religious activities that they used to participate in? Is the child receiving inappropriate gifts? Is a child never left alone by a friend? Are they being isolated by that person? Are they suddenly acting quiet and sneaky? Have they had a change in behavior? They suddenly dislike things that they normally loved or were interested in? Are they wearing too much makeup, scanty clothing, or very expensive clothing? Things that for their age are not appropriate. Are they having a lot of infections where they have to be treated and go to the doctor? Do they seem confused? Are they seeming like they have mental or physical abuse or issues that they didn't have before? Are they being, uh, are they engaging in behaviors where it would be a sign that someone's intimidating them or they're being submissive in areas they wouldn't normally be? Are they being coached on what to say? Do they lack personal possessions or do they have personal possessions they wouldn't ordinarily have? Do they have freedom of movement? Is somebody strange picking them up from school or waiting for them when they get off the bus? These are all signs that something's not right. Now, I haven't mentioned all of the signs because we'd need to be here another hour, but those are all indicators and there's more. Use your gut, ask questions. Just because some of the things I've said are present doesn't mean someone's getting abused, but it doesn't mean they're not getting abused. They're all indicators. And of course, to take something to court or to go to law enforcement, we need evidence, we need proof. But for you to intervene and just say, is there something you'd like me to know? Can I help? Doesn't take law enforcement. And then if they do need help, take them to the right place. Make sure that you are taking them to law enforcement or to a domestic violence shelter, calling some of the resources that we have um, in the chat. There's all sorts of resources. If they can't use their phone, if they're scared to use their phone or computer, let them use yours because when they're being abused, predators check out what phone calls have they made? What sites are they going to? So act with extreme caution. There are a lot of resources. There's the National Domestic Violence Hotline, the National Sexual Assault Hotline. Um, there's a Stalking Crisis Center, the Women's Law or Organization. There's a place called Futures Without Violence, PAVE, which is promoting awareness, uh, victim empowerment. There are not just these resources, but multiple resources all around us. Tap into one. We must, in order to make meaningful change, prioritize sexual assault and domestic violence and ensure that everyone is trained and that we start training children from a very, very young age and that everyone from the janitor in a business to the top CEO executive is trained to recognize and to report and told how to report. With the statistics being half of all people will be abused in some form, we also need to make sure because victims don't come forward. We know that. We need to make sure they don't feel blamed for what they couldn't control. You need to always emphasize that the abuse was not in their control. They shouldn't be blamed. They shouldn't feel like less. We may need to make sure that people know and children especially know that they have rights that no one has the right to touch them, that there's such a thing called informed consent. Before you touch me, 
even if you're a doctor, I have the right to say, what are you going to do? And if you're a friend or an acquaintance before you give me a hug, you should say, can I hug you? And if the answer is no, that's a boundary. That's a good thing. Don't take it as an insult. We need to make sure that people set up boundaries and we are assisting them with setting boundaries by honoring those. We should never belittle anyone for asking a question or asking permission or saying no to giving you permission. We need to teach our children that they are more, not less, to trust their gut, to speak out until they're heard. And we also need to make sure our children have a safe person, a safe place that they can go because not all people will go to their parents. I know I didn't go to my parents for everything. I know that none of you, I don't think that if I asked anybody, did you or, or all of you raise your hand if you always went to your parents? I don't think I'd see a hand. I'm not going to ask you now. I don't want to embarrass you. But if someone says, oh, I always went to my parents 100% of the time, I want to know because you'd be the only one in any group of thousands I've addressed. So we all need to recognize that and teach our children that there is a safe place they can go to. For me, I had my siblings and I always told my children, you can go to your aunts and uncles and they won't tell me, but they will get you help. We all need to teach our children that. If we start by teaching our children, then the next generations will be safer than the generation we currently have now. We need to stop asking why. Why shames and blames? Why needs to retire to science? And think about it, if you don't believe me, think about your own life. When you went home and your mother or father said, why are you late? You just gave a quick answer and got out of there. When you went home and said, oh geez, I didn't finish my homework. Your parents says, why? You had plenty of time. Why didn't you do it before dinner? Why didn't you make your bed? Why didn't you do your homework? Why are you wearing that? Those questions are all shaming and blaming. You're not giving your parent the full story. You're getting out of there. So if you feel like that, think about how, how someone asks when you ask why. Make sure that we eradicate why in this equation. Ask, what would you like me to know and how can I help? Get the full story. Make sure that with that full story, then you can get help. Be the voice. Be the miracle. It's okay to be wrong, but if you are right and you help just one person, you are their hero. And ask yourself, do I want domestic abuse and sexual assault to end in all forms? And I think I have, even though we're all in silence, except for me, I have an overwhelming voice in my head of all of you cheering, yes, let's eradicate it. So don't be a bystander, don't partner with abuse and predators by being silent. Because when we are silent, when we see something awful, horrific happening, when we don't investigate further, when we don't dial 911, we are a co-conspirator. And I refuse to be a silent co-conspirator. I will always be the obnoxious voice for change. Inaction is an action. Silence is indifference. And justice requires action and a voice. And I know we, it's a few minutes to taking questions, but I want you to think about this. Predators avoid consequences. So I have flipped that word into something I want you to remember. Avoid, A-V-O-I-D. A stands for advocate for change. Ask what you can do to help. Alter the stigma associated with reporting. V stands for be the voice for the voiceless, turn victims into thrivers, vote for legislators who will help. O, outmaneuver and outmanipulate and outthink predators by recognizing their behavior and calling it out and taking away their power and control. Don't allow the grooming and gaslighting anymore. Outcast it. I, Institutionalize change by being and demanding regulation, investigation, prosecution, and retraining, and don't allow silence and complicity. Involve yourself in these issues. Don't give up. Be that voice. Be the insurance for change 
which is in each of us. We all can be that insurance that this is eradicated. And D, dismantle predators, distance them from their prey and demand an end to the system of silence that we now have in place. And that would be my plan to avoid and void domestic and sexual abuse and protect everyone's right to a happy life and a happy future, which every human being deserves. And with that, I will take your questions. Paul, you're on mute. I, after all this time, you would think, right? Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to unmute. We have about 50 or so people in the room, um, or you can put a question in the chat. Judge, as people are thinking about it, you started and sort of ended with the theme of no voice, no choice, and the V and avoid is voice for the voiceless. Why don't you think more people speak up or speak out, given that what the data tells yeah. us? Here is a really sad truth. And how do I know this? Because again, I have, I don't know, countless juries I've had now, hundreds, I don't know, maybe thousands between my practice and being a judge and being in the military. There's just, um, I've talked to so many people who have passed judgment, really. That's what the jury does. The judge decides the law, the jury decides what the facts are. And I have gone back and talked to the jury who has said not guilty. And I've had pro crying prosecutors say, what else did you need? And juries say, it's not just one jury panel who's told me this, that's the life they chose and we're not going to interfere in it. And I don't think that there is a sadder commentary on our world than that. We have to get involved. People are afraid of being wrong. They want to be on the right team, the good team, the winning team. Well, I'm not afraid of getting involved. I'm not afraid of being told I'm wrong. I learn from every time the Court of Appeals tells me I'm wrong or my parents tell me I'm wrong or my friends or any of you tell me I'm wrong. I'll learn from that. It's okay with me. I would rather learn and grow than ignore something that's right in front of my face that can be damaging to another human being. I'm going to be a troublemaker my whole life, and I'm willing to accept the consequence for that. I'm not willing to accept the consequence for being silent and watching another human being hurt. Sadly, so many people are willing to accept the silence because they're afraid of being involved. Yeah. Is the, uh, the opportunity to learn, is, is that the main driver behind talking to juries after Yes, I always say, uh, well, first of all, there's there's a couple of things. Juries, it's one of the hardest jobs, I think, in our courthouse is being a jury and having to decide someone else's life. We all know this in the legal business. It's something we do, just like doctors operate. They see blood, intestines, and all of that. They don't fall over and faint. You know, we, I think, don't realize the effect of the decisions they make that is new to them. They have control over someone's future. So to go and to answer their questions so they feel better is always a positive. But also, as lawyers and judges, we learn from books how juries think and feel. Most of the people who've written those books have not been a juror hundreds of times. So hundreds of times I've spoken to juries. They tell us what they like, what they didn't like, what we should do again. Uh, they've told police, you're sloppy do a better investigation. They've told lawyers, is this your first trial? Why did you button and unbutton your shirt 300 or your jacket 350 times? Because we counted and it was distracting. So we all use this as a, a learning tool, not to be embarrassing to anybody, but because we're all in this to make our legal system better. And so we use it as a learning tool, but also uh, the jurors go out there and I know this because I've run into them in the community and they say, you know, that was a great experience and here's what I've learned. And I think it's important to take the stigma out of being a victim, to take the stigma out of jury duty so awful. So as much as I can, I talk and let people uh, speak their truth and we get to the bottom of what's the problem, what's the good thing, what's the right thing. And it does just work. It works. Talking works. 
Is is there a theme or a take a major takeaway from the conversations you've had with juries over the years? Hundred percent of the time, jurors say, "I didn't want to be a juror." But now that I have been one, I realize how important it, it was and how important the decision is to the community. And I enjoyed it and I'm looking forward to doing it again. And I'm going to spread the word. I think that when we don't know something, we're afraid of it. We don't know getting involved in domestic violence and reporting it, what the outcome is going to be or how people are going to be uh, received as, you know, uh, a gossip or are they really helping someone? And so they're, they're afraid. They're also ashamed that this is going on in their house or their neighborhood or with their friends. So we take the stigma out of that uh, by having conversations and jurors spread the word that, hey, this was a great thing. Yeah. Uh, any questions in the room? Keep them, um, come on, speak up or, or put them in the chat. Most of us um, in the room, not all of us, uh, work in higher education. You know, many of us at the law school and we know the rate. I mean, I've been in higher ed for 35 years and sat on task forces and had roundtable discussions and but the the rate doesn't seem to be changing. If anything, it seems like it's increasing. Um, what ideas do you have or thoughts about in this particular environment, higher education, maybe law schools that we need to be really looking out for in our classrooms and our libraries and one-on-one mm -hmm. -on -one conversations that, you know, that we think are just kind of maybe off a little bit, but but really there's something deeper going on there. I think we all need to, as educators, we all need to be trained on how to recognize uh, assault, abuse, those things that we see, but also to take action in terms of leaving the door open, not having closed things happen behind closed doors, letting students know uh, they can have a, another person in the room. But also, I am, you know, I, I teach defending battered women. I, I always call it defending battered people. Um, because men get abused too. But it has not escaped me that over the, I don't know, a couple decades that uh, Cooley has allowed me to teach that class, that, and the, it's a paper class, every single class, because I make them do a presentation, two, if not three or more of the students will do a paper on the abuse that they experienced. And it's really cathartic and helpful for them. And usually the class starts crying because, you know, it's one of their own and they didn't know. And I think that we need to mandate classes on sexual abuse, domestic violence in all areas of education, whether it's in kindergarten, law school, medical school, accounting, it doesn't matter. We need to be able to recognize it and eradicate it if we don't partner together. This will continue the silence of shame, the silence of not speaking uh, their truth and and hiding behind that silence is going to continue and predators know that we need to expose them. Mm. One of my colleagues in the room is asking um, there are about a fifth of, of our participants today are men. Mm -hmm. What do you make of this and how do we get more men involved or interested in? Yeah, so. The numbers for men are way too low. Uh, I think that men may not be assaulted as often as women, but I think that they're probably triple of what's being reported. I have seen men who've been victims in my courtroom and we need to get rid of the stigma. And I'm really honored that the men are here wanting to talk about this because we need to change language. Like for example, with women, we should not allow each other to say, well, you must have PMS. That's why you're in a bad mood. So what I say is, hell yes, I have PMS. And PMS means promote, mentor, and support. And for men, mm -hmm. don't use the term man up because man up shames and blames men. It means whatever the bad thing is, shoulder it, you be quiet about it and move forward because you can take it. You don't have to take it. Man up needs to mean I speak up. I will not allow you to abuse me or anyone else. I am the voice. And men and women need to partner together to eradicate uh, sexual assault. And of course, we can't ignore the, uh, um, you know, the lesbian, gay, transgender, the LGBTQ community as, has horrifying numbers. And we need to accept them as human beings 
we all need to treat each other with kindness and speak out against this and just be each other's voice and partner. If we don't do that, uh, we're doomed to, to have this cycle of violence again and again. And for the men, you know, here's the thing. How many men are comfortable saying vagina? Well, go in your mirror and when you're shaving, go say the word vagina. And women, if you can't say the word penis, go in the mirror when you're blow drying your hair and say it. We need to get used to using the words vagina and penis. And no. And use the correct vocabulary, teaching our children and talking about it publicly, not using um, vulgar language to describe it. But if we can own that it's a reality, we all have body parts and we have the right to our bodies and we talk about it like that, we can again start that conversation because right now that's not, that's not what's happening. Talking about uh, subpopulations, another one is uh, the military. And we have a question here from our one of our participants, Benjamin, uh, who started just recently working with military veterans over in Kalamazoo. Um, do you have any advice for working with clients who are victims of military sexual trauma? I, you know, um, they need to go to a, tra a trained trauma therapist if it's, here's the thing, if they're retired, there's not much they can do about it in the military at that point. But when I was in the military, I didn't experience any of that, but I represented a lot of people. And what I did was I always got the chaplain involved. I got the inspector general involved. We did investigations and we prosecuted. And the military is really good about doing that. But I know that because of rank, because it seems demeaning to a soldier who, you know, we carry guns, we're highly trained to come forth and say, I've been assaulted. It's very difficult. So um, they need to be able to tell their JAG officer and work with a JAG officer who they trust. Um, for those who are retired, the military does have some really good services, but they really need a trauma informed therapist because they're going to have to rewire that individual and um, give them some tools because there's just going to be a lot of triggers and the military's all around us. I don't have all of the answers, um, but I do know that there are special people who are trained in that. Thank you. Um, Certainly with the Nasser case, and now we're seeing it, I think, with the Deshaun Watson case, the NFL player out of uh, Houston, Texas, who, who had um, victims coming forward. One came forward, and then you saw a larger group yes. of women come forward. Explain that phenomenon and what your perspective is of why it takes one to make many or to, you know, for more people to come forward. Yeah. So let me, and I'll tell you the phenomena in the Nasser case. I have always, I've been a judge now 17 years and from the day I took the bench, I've always let every person speak because I don't believe and never will believe that crime has a border. And when you are a victim, it doesn't mean that the victim who was assaulted is the only victim, their husband, wife, children, boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever it is the case, they also are affected. So I've always let everybody speak. When Nasser came about, um, the prosecutor said, as part of the deal, we want other victims to speak. And I said, well, I, I always do that. That's not a problem. I'm not going to put any limit. They had put a limit, I think, in, in the end of, of about 125 people. I listened to 169, 156 were sister survivors, as I dubbed them. The list, because I said, you don't have to use your name, but please give us a letter in case you break down so that uh, someone else can read it. And they wrote their letters, their victim letters, and they came forward. And the day of trial, I, or I'm sorry, not trial, because he pled the day of the sentencing. I only had about six names of people who were actually going to use their name. But when they came in court and they saw each other, testify and say, I am not a number. I am a name and you look at me when I speak. With the first one speaking and then the next one and the next one, they empowered each other. 
And I learned much later in talking with some of them that they felt that if that person that went ahead of them, if the people that went ahead of them were strong enough, so were they. And they wanted to partner with those other people who didn't have a voice to give them a voice and give themselves a voice. So it really just takes one person to speak out and give the strength to others. Being the first one is terribly scary. But as you saw, one person spoke and then another and another. And in the end, only about six didn't use their name. They wanted to own it, say, you hurt me and here's who I am and you look at me. And in so doing, they took a big piece of themselves back and they took their power back. And I watched them grow 10 feet tall. They came in very shy and small and they left 10 feet tall. And for me, I felt that with each one speaking that I was being handed a new baby and I had that Everyone said, how could you endure that pain? Well, because I had that exhilaration of being handed a new baby. I didn't remember the pain. I just remembered them growing into these huge, thriving towers of strength. And I think that's what happens when it's one and someone else says, yeah, that happened to me too. And that's why me too is called me too, because it takes one to speak out and provide that, that uh, ripple of strength to the next one and the next one. Thank you for that. Um, Sharon, I don't want to put you on the spot, but you're making some powerful statements in the chat. I wonder if you'd want to speak up. No obligation. If, if you don't, that's fine too. I, I, I don't know, Rosemary, what do you think? It's up to you. Uh, okay, I'll go for it. Um, Rosemary is aware of who I am. Uh, She's been a champion of mine for over a year now, and I'm not really sure where I would have been without her. Um, she gave me strength when I needed it most. Uh, and, you know, the first hurdle was um, my being asked to allow my name to become public. Um, I am at the center of a clergy sexual abuse scandal in New York. And um, New York passed a law last year called the Child Victims Act. And it allowed people like me um, who were abused decades ago to come forward and tell what happened to them. And I was introduced to religion at what I consider its highest level because my mother ran the parish of the diocese that is now being scrutinized. And um, I am being represented by uh, an attorney named Mitchell Garabedian. And uh, he told me in the very beginning uh, that he felt it was important for me to come out and use my name because my family is so well known and uh, that he felt that it would be empowering, empowering to other victims. So after a lot of, you know, heartfelt thought and talking to people, you know, like Rosemary, like other people in our group that we had formed during the pandemic, um, I realized that this was something I had to do um the day after mitch made my name public a woman came forward with documents in her hands and said that her father had written to the bishop who i was accusing of sexually assaulting me and her father was going to this bishop to help him stop the Monsignor who was abusing his daughter. And within three or four weeks, 203 people came forward and said, me too. And the most disturbing part of it really is to hear specifics of your abuse being told by another person 
they experience the identical the the identical talk the identical ruse that was used to isolate us to get us alone to get us in a in a place where they could do what they wanted to do the same things were being told to children they were known ruses and they're doing this to 10 year old children and i just found that to be absolutely horrific especially considering i mean not like any organization this would be acceptable in but the catholic church they didn't rob me of my virginity they robbed me of my identity they robbed me of my spirituality they took god away from me and now they make me feel like i'm marginalized and i don't matter and I'm the enemy now. And now they are defending themselves against what I'm saying. But the problem is that there are witnesses in my case. And so there's, there's no managing this. There's no damage control here. This is going to come out. And, you know, like Rosemary said, it should come out. And maybe if it does, maybe i'll help just one other person and that's okay with me and i think you've helped (laughs) helped countless people thank you for sharing that with us you are so strong you are a superhero you know that you you started this landslide and you know what i am a catholic and devastated at what they have done and you know it's moved me a bit away from the church because of the hypocrisy but you are a great human being and you matter and thank you so much for your strength and sharing that with us today thank you thank you for everything really you're just one of my angels and i'll i'll i just always have such a strong love for you as you know i i just i couldn't have done this without you thank you very powerful yeah i think what what sharon um has done and what she by telling us and using her voice it helps to heal and i think we need to have that active listening when people are are in trauma or we think they are we need to be open to the listening and then take action based on the situation and then have an actual investigation and Mm -hmm. then have appropriate retraining and legal action i mean we cannot walk on this crunchy carpet of silence anymore. We've got to lift the carpet and clean it out and start over. You know, so what is it about, you know, the U.S. military, the Catholic Church, USA Gymnastics, um, these large organizations that we see um, kind yeah. of perpetuate the abuse? Um, what's up with that? Yeah, I'll tell you what's up with that. And as Americans, I think you can all relate to this. It's it's money Mm -hmm. and medals over the safety of children. It's Mm -hmm. about winning at all costs. We can no longer win at all costs. And I'll tell you something with the Olympics coming up. One of my biggest disappointments is that all of those people, whether it's Coca-Cola or Adidas or whoever supports the Olympics, they need to pull out and say, when you clean up, when we don't see this abuse, we will be happy to sponsor. Otherwise, we're pulling out. And I wish the American people would say we will not support anyone who sponsors abusive, uh, the, the culture of abuse, whether it's in gymnasts or baseball or swimming or whatever it is, uh, and not just, not just in sports, even the Catholic Church. Why should I donate to people who just uh, who have predatory behavior? I will donate where I know there's good being done. And I think as a people, if we take the money away from it and start away from those people who are providing the abusers to continue, we're going to see it cleaned up. And if we vote for legislators who commit to making change, we will also see change. Before you vote for someone, ask them, what are you going to do to stop this problem? And if they don't have an answer, move on to the next candidate. I don't care if they're Democrat, Republican, Independent. They need to do the right thing and step up and be our voice. Otherwise, they need to get out of the state house. They need to get out of the 
uh, uh, Congress, they need to just step aside and go pour my coffee. Mm. <laughs> you know, um, you mentioned money and metals. I thought you were going to say another M word, men. Mm, not necessarily. There, I know, I know female athletes who've been abused by female coaches. Yes. Yeah. 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 You can't you can't but, say that no that that no one's exempt from being abused and you can't say you can't give a description of an abuser because the abusers look like your next door neighbor who you have coffee with in the morning. Uh, right, right. they don't they don't look like, you know, the homeless person who's down on their luck on the corner. That person's down on their luck. I suspect they're not a predator. You mm -hmm. cannot put anybody in a box like that. So we need mm -hmm. to be wary. It, it can't be assigned to uh, simply men being predators. There are plenty of female predators. I see them in my courtroom. Thank you for that. Um, we have about five minutes left. Um, I I want to ask you a question about um, the Nasser case and three years later, as you look yeah. back. Any, what have you learned? Would you have done anything differently? Would you, do you think that there was a, a process for you personally as a judge that you learned something that you carry forward today to make you a stronger advocate? Mm. Um, I don't know. Here's the thing is I handled that really. I didn't know, you know, I, I'm so busy. I don't watch the Olympics. I'm sorry to say, unless my family, my family does. They say, come over here and watch the skier or this, you know, gymnast or what have you. Uh, I didn't know it was going to be as big as it was. So I handled it like I handle all my cases. I let everybody speak. I give them as much time as they want. I truly believe it's the people's court. However, um, that being said, I have learned that the legal system is completely broken. I've had a few arguments with prosecutors and even my own staff about this, but I believe that each and every time someone is touched, there ought to be a charge. Nasser had 29 counts, uh, and then they he pled to seven, and they did not issue on the child pornography on his phone. That was part of the plea agreement. And I see this all the time where prosecutors choose, oh, two or three counts is enough, when in fact someone has been assaulted several times. They just say, well, three times is enough. The jury doesn't need more. Well, let me just tell you, the victim needs more. If the victim is touched 100 times, there ought to be 100 charges. And I will make the time on my docket for that. And if you listen to the Nasser case, just Trine Gonzer was assaulted, I think, over 800, 850 times. There should have been 850 charges just for her. Mm -hmm. Let the jury decide. And I think we are doing a disservice by picking and choosing the charges, if they fit the elements, if they fit them once, fine. If they fit them 300 times, there ought to be 300 charges. I think overall we're broken. Law enforcement believing the predator with his evidence, they should always have a protocol to go and check the evidence with somebody independent, not believe the predator or the person who the finger is being pointed at. Medical people, I don't understand why the records are not being released from Michigan State. We we need to know where it went wrong and who else was a co-conspirator with those people who've already been charged. There are licensed people who knew this was going on. Why were there no nurses? Why did everybody leave a doctor and, and a patient alone in the room? What the case has left me with is questioning our legal system, our medical system, our system of justice, our society, and wondering what else can I do? What have I missed? How can I help? And that's why I'm going around the world and speaking and coming up with ideas and telling people, vote for those people for change, ask questions. You know, uh, children should not be, I like Santa Claus, okay, it's a good story. I like watching the movies and the cartoons, but Children should not be told to sit on a strange man's lap. We need to change. And what I learned the most from Nasser, because it's not the worst case I've had, it's the worst by numbers, but what I learned are all of the missing pieces that I learned when I was in law school and when I was in the military serving and I learned all about the Constitution and all about our rights that we're not honoring the rights that we have in this country when we don't honor the voice of a victim and let the jury decide each and every count. Important insight for the lawyers and law students and prospective law students in the room. Judge, we can't thank you enough. 
uh, for joining us today. We know that your schedule is is very, very busy. Thank everybody for participating today. Can I just um, do one thing? I know we sure. only have one minute, but I want sure. you all to join me. And I know some of you don't have your screens on and that's okay. I hope you can see me, but I like to close. Um, and then of course you can do your closing, but I always like to close meetings with something that you can pass on. So uh, for those of you who have your hands, I want you to, uh, I want to borrow your hands and I want you to repeat after me. It might feel dumb, but it's not, I promise you. And I want you to pass this on. I need the cheerleader boy and girl in you. Okay. So I have a voice. I have a voice. I am victorious. I, I am victorious. I am a winner. I am, I am a winner. winner. I'm a winner. I matter. And I matter. I, matter. I, matter. I am powerful. I am and powerful. I'm powerful. Spread the world, spread this word and go make the world a better, safer place. You matter. Thank you, Rosemary. Thank you, Judge. Well, I only end with that. We'll see you next month in our next conversation. Everybody, Thank enjoy you. your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Thank, Thank you. you. Great seeing all of you.